but hello everyone. Uh, my name is Marco Gallo at the University of Calgary, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to the seminar series of the CERC network. Uh, today we have two excellent presenters from Toronto, Ontario. Uh, Dr. Mathieu Lucien uh, from the University of Toronto um, and senior scientist Princess Margaret and a postdoc uh, in the Lucian lab, Giacomo Grillo. So today we're gonna start uh, with the PI talk first, um, Mathieu Lucien's talk. And so it's my a real, a real pleasure to, to introduce Mathieu to, uh, to all of you. Uh, Dr. Lukin is a senior scientist at Princess Margaret, as I said. Uh, he joined the Institute in 2012. He's also a professor at the University of Toronto and holds a cross appointment with the Ontario Institute for Cancer Research. He serves in the senior advisory group and uh, research council on oncology to the, uh, the Princess Margaret Cancer Center. Before becoming a PI, uh, Dr. Lukin earned his PhD at McGill University and then he did his, his postdoc at the Dana Farber Cancer Institute under the supervision of Dr. Miles Brown. Uh, he also did an executive education degree at Harvard Business School. Dr. Lupien's research is focused on chromatin and epigenetics, uh, with a special focus on uh, prostate cancer and, bre and breast cancer, but he's uh, uh, obviously investigated other cancer types, including, including brain cancer. And he's made incredible headway and uh, set the standard on uh, what we know about uh, the non-coding genome, identify the terminants of oncogenesis in the non-coding genome, and accelerated the development of chromatin and epigenetic-based precision medicine approaches um, against cancer. There are lots of awards that Dr. Lupien has received over the years. I'm just gonna name a few of them. The most, uh, some, of, uh, some very prestigious ones, including the Canadian Cancer Society Bernard and Francine Berval Award for Excellent, Excellence, and is a two-time recipient of the Till and McCullough uh, Discovery of the Year Award and the Investigator Award from OICR. But a very personal note, Dr. Lupin is also an amazing mentor and uh, an amazing friend, a uh, fantastic scientist. So I'm really looking forward to hearing his talk today. And uh, I'll stop sharing my screen so that you, Mathieu, can uh, show your data. Thank you so much, uh, Marco, for the introduction. It's always a uh, uh, heart heartwarming to hear these comments when they come from someone that I've worked with in the past. And um, uh, honestly, it's a huge thank you. It's a real pleasure to be here. Thank you for the invitation. And so I look very much forward to engaging in the next hour with the community to be able to provide our perspective, the perspective that my lab is putting forward to the research community at large about how to best understand oncogenesis uh, through chromatin. And so what I'll be doing today is present the concept of chromatin variants and how we've been studying chromatin variants in cancer in order to actually reveal a role for repetitive DNA sequences that are found within the human genome and showcase how this can actually relate the cancer stemness properties, all right? Perfect, all right. So the first and foremost premise that I think I need to discuss is this uh, concept that we've all been exposed to in terms of our education, which is that cancer is thought to be a disease of mutations, a disease that relies on the accumulation of genetic variants, whether they be single nucleotide variants, point mutations, or structural variants, right? Rearrangements and the likes. And the concept that we've all been exposed to is this notion that for a normal cell to become a cancer cell, it needs to acquire a series of these genetic variants that enable a cell, a normal cell, to be uh, tra um, uh, uh, um, transformed to the point of giving rise to a tumor. Okay, so multi multi series hits of genetic variants are needed, and the underlying principle behind this concept is that it implies that each tumor should have a unique genotype. Okay, and to that point, there's been tremendous efforts that have culminate, culminated in recent years with international efforts, such as those led by the International Cancer Genomic Con uh, Consortium uh, or the Cancer Genome Atlas, so ICGC and TCGC, uh, TCGA, sorry, that have gone forward in mapping mutations across a large number of tumors uh, that were capturing the biology from a large collections of cancer types. And the figure that I'm showing you here is more or less a summary of that discovery. Uh, what this is showing is on the y-axis, the number of mutations per megabases that have been captured within individual tumors across a collections of cancer types. So the x-axis is all different cancer types or different cancer, cancer types being assessed by different groups. 
And so within each column, you see a collection of dots. Each dot corresponds to a tumor and provides the information as to regards to the number of mutations one finds in a given tumor per megabasis. And so what you can see is that indeed there are a ton of mutations in any individual tumor that one can assess. There is variability in the numbers, of course, within a cancer type as well as between cancer types. Uh, some of the cancer types found down at the far left, for instance, commonly being pediatric types of cancers, which aren't exposed for as a long period of time to carcinogens, right? And so, but still, there are mutations. So this concept that cancer has uh, a own genotype that is driven by mutation makes sense. And there is evidence that indeed there are a ton of mutations. But now from these mutations, not all mutations are driver mutations. A lot of those are passenger mutations. And so there's been significant effort led by the community, including my group, to try to mine mutations that are found across the genome in order to distinguish those mutations that fall within cancer driver units versus those that fall outside of cancer driver units that would therefore be called passenger mutations. And so I have summarized this, this work in this single slide here, just showcasing how the community has moved forward to distinguish cancer driver events using mutations versus passenger mutations. And so for instance, if one is interested in finding uh, cancer driver genes, one would look at mutations within the coding space. And as depicted in this schematic representation here that I'm highlighting with my mice, uh, the, top, the top section, what you can see is the way that the community has gone forward has been to identify genes, which would be depicted here by this rectangle uh, shape, as having more mutations, the circles, than expected by chance. And so in the case of a gene that's significantly burdened by mutation, such as this gene on the left, versus the expected burden of mutation, which would in this case would be significantly less, would allow one to call this given gene as a cancer driver gene because it's burdened by mutations more than expected by chance. And that's one of multiple methods that have been used to call cancer driver genes based on mutations. Similarly, work has been done in the non-coding space to find cancer driver events. And so many of you are probably familiar with uh, individual CREs being listed as cancer driver events. Uh, by CRE, I mean cis regulatory elements. The best case example is the promoter of the TERT gene known to be mutated in a subset of different cancer types at a very high frequency to enable increased expression of the TERT gene. So that's an example of a cancer driver CRE, a cancer driver cis regulatory element. My group has committed uh, its time in the past to actually capture additional types of cancer drivers within the non-coding space. Uh, we've demonstrated in prostate cancer and in breast cancer the existence of cancer driver regulatory plexuses, regulatory plexuses corresponding to the promoter and all associated distal cis regulatory elements, such as enhancers, that work together to regulate the expression of a single gene. And so we've demonstrated that such regulatory plexuses for the estrogen receptor, for instance, is burdened by mutation more than expected by chance in breast cancer in accordance with the estrogen receptor gene itself not needing to be mutated but rather elements that regulate its expression being mutated in order to ensure a sustained expression of this oncogene. Uh, and the last method we've developed that we've put forward to find uh, drivers, cancer drivers from mutations in the non-coding space has been to specifically look for cancer driver cystromes, uh, cystrome being the sum of binding site for a single transcription factor in a given cell type or cell state. And so in prostate cancer, as well as in breast cancer, we've been able there as well uh, we've been able to identify cancer driver cystromes. So the cystrome for specific transcription factors being burdened by mutation more than expected by chance in breast cancer or in prostate cancer, for instance, in the case that we've studied so far. Now, this is all nice and in agreement with this notion that mutations can contribute to oncogenesis, but there's still an aspect that all of us that have worked on chromatin are fully aware of, which is that it is totally possible to establish thousands of different phenotypes starting from a single genotype. And each and every single one of us is an, is an example of this, right? In principle, every single cell in our body or almost have the exact same genotype. And yet we are in a position to establish cells with completely different functions. There's thousands and thousands of cells with completely different functions that enable to create one of many different organs, right? 
So a neuron doesn't look anything like a muscle cell and so on and so forth, yet it has more or less the exact same genotype. So how can this be achieved? Well, from developmental studies, what we know is that it's possible to establish a different phenotype from a single genotype based on chromatin, right? That this is reflected in the chromatin. So what do I mean by this? Well, chromatin, as I presume most of you are familiar with, is this complex between proteins and DNA. Specific proteins of interest include the histones. Histones can come together to form an octomer that defines the protein component of a nucleosome. And so within that octomer, there's about 147 base pairs of DNA that's wrapped around it to establish the nucleosome, this complex between uh, um, the histone octomer and DNA. And the spacing between nucleosome more or less defines, reflects the nature of a given sequence of DNA as being found, for instance, in highly compacted chromatin, as is shown in the upper section of this figure, or rather be found in what one would refer to as accessible open chromatin as depicted in the figure in the bottom. To be specific, the distinction here is really in terms of the nucleosome density within a stretch of DNA of interest, okay? If you have high nucleosome density, then it's condensed. If it's a lower nucleosome density, then you suddenly gain accessibility of certain DNA sequences between nucleosome, therefore defining that region as more accessible, more open than others. And so this more or less reflects the nature of the chromatin and being able to adopt one of multiple different states. I'm describing the states here purely based on chromatin accessibility but we can definitely layer additional pieces of information on top of the diagram that I'm showing you here to refine our distinctions in chromatin states. So for instance, we know that the proteins can be modified, phosphorylated, methylated, acetylated, and so on and so forth. And that the combination of these modifications can actually define distinct chromatin states. But the simplest state to compare here is compacted versus accessible. And so if we have that notion in mind, that chromatin for a given stretch of DNA can present itself in one of many different chromatin states, then we're in a position when comparing between cell states or between cell types or between, between tissue types to identify sections of the genomes that according to our definition, correspond to chromatin variants. And what I mean by this is that we can identify regions in the genome between cell states that are found in different chromatin states. So the diagram here, for instance, shows such a sequence that is found in compacted chromatin in cell state one, and then it's found in accessible chromatin in cell state two. So this polymorphism at the chromatin level enables you to identify regions that we refer to as chromatin variants. And when you think of these chromatin variants and how they could relate to cell type specificity, to phenotypic, uh, distinctions despite having a single genotype. Well, here's a case example from actual data that was published a few years back by Vader Molman uh, and the team uh, of ENCODE. What we're looking at here are at the bottom specifically profiles of chromatin accessibility across a collection of different cell types or tissue types that are labeled here on the far right based on the color code that you see. So the top one is trophoblast in yellow, for instance, and if you go down and pale green, there's the fetal heart. Now, if you look at this figure closely, what you see is that for a given DNA sequence, which is uh, highlighted here under the number one in this gray zone, if you look at the accessible signal, the signal of chromatin accessibility, if you more or less measure the chromatin states across all the different tissue and cell types listed here, what you see is that you have signal of accessibility only in the trophoblast. These, this given region, this given DNA sequence is always found in compacted chromatin and all other cell types or tissue types listed in this figure. And so what this states is that this region corresponds to a chromatin variant specific to trophoblast. So a region of the genome that's uniquely accessible in trophoblast, not in any of the other tissues or cell types assessed. Similarly, I'll take you to the region five, which is showcased here. So this region is another DNA sequence in the genome, and it is only accessible in fetal heart, the green cells, okay? It is inaccessible in all other cell types, tissue types. And so what this tells us is that this DNA sequence corresponds to a chromatin variant specific to fetal heart. 
Now, this, this figure is just showing you uh, a few specific case examples, but if you start scanning the genome for coordinates that behave in the same fashion, then you can start to see thousands and thousands of regions that would, for instance, behave similarly to the region depicted under number one. And so here at the top, there's a figure that looks at over 3.5 million different DNA sequences within the human genome. These are on average of two to 300 base pairs in size, and they've been grouped according to whether they behave similarly to this first sequence, to this fifth sequence, and so on and so forth. And so you can see here that you end up with thousands of regions. Each, uh, each um, column is a, different, uh, is a different coordinate of the genome of two to 300 base pairs in size. There are thousands of such regions that behave exactly as this single region depicted here at the bottom, i.e. that are chromatin variants specific to trophoblasts. And so when you end up with so many sites that behave in a similar fashion, we call these regions chromatin variant signatures. So a signature corresponds to a, se a selection of DNA sequences that behave similarly in terms of chromatin states, i.e. that could be in this instance, a signature specific to trophoblast corresponding to thousands of regions that are uniquely accessible in trophoblasts. All right, good. So that's the intro. So now, how is it that we use chromatin variants to better understand the biology of cancer? And specifically with this talk that I'm giving you with relevance to stemness properties? Well, here is what we can do. First, I'm going to convince you of the relevance in a normal setting. What we were in a position to do was to look at uh, hematopoiesis, so blood production a process that relies on uh, long-term and short-term hematopoietic stem cells that are found at the apex of the differentiation tree for hematopoiesis. These cells can give rise to one of multiple progenitor populations that are listed in this quadrant. And then these populations, these progenitors populations can then further differentiate into one of many different mature population, B cells, T cells, NK cells, and so on and so forth. So, the key difference here is in terms of looking at long-term versus short-term hematopoietic stem cells. These two cells have the ability to give rise to the entire set of populations that are depicted in this diagram. However, short-term hematopoietic stem cells can only give rise to this full set of populations once or twice. Long-term hematopoietic stem cells have the ability to self-renew for as long as they've ever been tested, okay, so that they can self-renew. The key distinctions between long-term and short-term is this ability to self-renew pretty much for as long as we've ever been able to test. So what we ended up doing was to work with the team of Professor John Dick at the Princess Margaret Cancer Center, who could purify each of these populations one by one. And then for each of these populations, we conducted uh, a tac seq an assay that allows us to identify regions of accessible chromatin across the genome for each of these populations. And then the next step, what we did was to identify chromatin variants that distinguish all of these populations in order to report chromatin variant signatures, okay? And here are the signatures. So on this figure, I'm showing you the signatures that we identified and the names, we gave those names, FYI. And then at the top here, I'm showing you the uh, populations that were profiled. So the long-term, short-term hematopoietic stem cells, B cells, T cells, and so on and so forth, okay? And then the scoring scheme that's presented in this panel is showcasing the strength of the signatures we identified. So for instance, one of the signatures we identified, we ended up calling in the T cell signature. The reason being that the sites, the chromatin variants found within this signature were uniquely found within the T cell population. So this would be a signature composed of coordinates that are uniquely accessible in T cells, not accessible in any of the other population part of the hematopoietic uh, differentiation tree. Similarly for B cells, which are listed here, we found a signature that was pretty much uniquely enriched in B cells. Again, arguing that this signature is composed of coordinates that are uniquely accessible in B cells. Now, when we started looking at signatures that were picking up a signal within the long-term and the short-term hematopoietic stem cells, we had a different story. What we realized there is that we had two signatures that were 
present in one or both of these populations, but also present in some of the other progenitor populations, not the mature populations, but the progenitor populations. In other words, what this is telling us is that it's extremely challenging to find coordinates uniquely accessible in short-term hematopoietic stem cells or uniquely accessible in long-term hematopoietic stem cells, but rather what we find are coordinates that are preferentially accessible in progenitors and stem populations compared to mature populations, because none of the mature populations were enriched for these signatures. The other thing we noticed, because we were interested in distinguishing the features that accounted for long-term self-renewing versus short-term abilities to self-renew, we were looking for differences in the enrichment of these signatures in long-term versus short-term hematopoietic stem cells. What we noticed is that the first signature, which we labeled long-term hematopoietic stem and progenitor cell, was present in both short and long-term hematopoietic stem cells. So no apparent differences there. However, we had this, the second signature, which we uh, labeled active HSPC, so active hematopoietic stem and progenitor cell, present in the short term as well as the progenitor populations, but absent from the long-term hematopoietic stem cells. So this told us that that signature harbored information that distinguished the features unique to long-term hematopoietic stem cells compared to downstream short-term hematopoietic stem cells or other progenitor populations. And so we mined the DNA sequences within those uh, signatures of chromatin accessibility as shown here. And what you can see is that in this, in this case, we ended up identifying a specific DNA sequence preferentially enriched within the signature missing from the long-term hematopoietic stem cell. That DNA sequence was one that corresponds to the motif recognized by the factor CTCF, a factor known to regulate 3D genome organi organization. And so what we ended up doing in this story was actually to assess whether CTCF was indeed capable of distinguishing features unique to long-term versus short-term hematopoietic stem cells. And in short, what we did was to silence CTCF in this case, silencing it in long-term hematopoietic stem cells. And what we observed with that was that cells were getting stuck in G0. The cells had a hard time exiting G0. And exiting G0 is a needed step for long-term hematopoietic stem cells to differentiate, to transition into a short-term hematopoietic stem cell before becoming a progenitor or a mature population. And through an agreement with this, with in vivo assays, when silencing CTCF, what we noticed is that there was an accumulation of long-term hematopoietic stem cells when CTCF was depleted. So in other words, this work defined CTCF as a gatekeeper of quiescence exit. CTCF, the minute it got activated, the minute it could get access to some DNA sequences, enabled long-term hematopoietic stem cells to exit quiescence and engage in the differentiation process to commit down a path of differentiation, okay? Now this analysis, which was published recently uh, and just summarized in what I've presented so far, was an incomplete story. All the work that we had done for that discovery was focused on understanding the biology from chromatin variants found within the non-repetitive DNA sequences of the genome. Now this is a problem. It was a technical reasons for doing it, but in, but in principle, it's, it's a problem in the sense that we're not sufficiently exploiting the human genome. And so it's a problem, but it's not a massive problem because most research used to focus on genes, which is only 1.5% of the genome. So at least the approach we had used for the work that I showed you just a second ago, expanded the analysis to the non-coding genome that is non-repetitive, which is a 40 something percent extra, but it dismissed close to 55% of the genome that's filled with repetitive DNA sequences. And so we decided to go back to the data and carefully assess the nature of chromatin variants over the repetitive genome. We specifically focused on the sections of the genome that correspond to transposable elements, which are showcased here with the uh, uh, red stars. This is about 45% of the genome that corresponds to transposable elements. And we decided to focus on transposable elements because there was already plenty in the literature showcasing a role for transposable elements in normal physiology, as well as in cancer, where they could behave as either transcripts or even as cis-regulatory elements influencing the expression of classical genes. And so we decided to assess whether chromatin variants were found within repetitive sequences, and if so, 
how they related the stemness property. First, again, here, focusing on normal hematopoiesis. And here's one of the first observations we made when we started looking at repetitive sequences. So here, what I'm showing you on the right side is all the chromatin accessibility data from stem populations, progenitor populations, and mature populations. So stem in red, progenitors in orange, mature in blue. And we're doing so over four different regions of the genomes that harbor transposable elements. So the transposable elements are depicted in the red box, as you can see here, labeled at the top. And if you look at the accessible chromatin signal across all of these populations, you can clearly see a black and white situation. These transposable elements are accessible in all the stem and progenitor populations. They're absent from the mature populations. This is uh, fabulous, black and white. Like we were shocked when we saw this and we're like, wow, okay. So based on this, we're like, we need to look into this in greater depth. So we did a systematic search classifying accessibility of the chromatin over transposable elements grouped according to families. So there's a close to a thousand of them and simply ask whether we could identify chromatin variants that were specific to stem, progenitor or mature populations, preferentially enriched within transposable elements family. So on this figure, we're showing on the y-axis, the transposable element families the color code is depicting the enrichment of or lack of according to all the populations we have. And I'll just draw your attention to primitive versus mature. Primitive are red, mature are blue, a black and white stratification, right? Huge distinct enrichment of accessibility over transposable elements. Here we looked at the quantification to try to distinguish which families were preferentially accessible in mature versus primitive populations. And what we saw was that the majority of transposable elements preferentially accessible in stem population and primitive populations were of the HERV1, HERV2, HERV3 family. In contrast, we also picked up transposable elements preferentially accessible in mature populations, typically the SIGN1 and SIGN2 elements. Now, we wanted to relate this to oncogenesis. We wanted to relate this to cancer. And so with regards to blood, the model of choice is AML, acute myeloid leukemia, where we very well know that there are distinct populations within AML, including one in particular of interest to us, the leukemia stem cell population. And the way the field typically goes at identifying these uh, populations is that they will, from a bulk sample, use facts uh, to sort out from two cell surface markers, CD34 and CD38, the leukemia stem cell positively enriched fraction from other fractions that are deprived of leukemia stem cells. And so from these four fractions, the way they distinguish which ones have leukemia stem cells is that they test them in a mouse model to see if a given fraction can establish a tumor or not. And if a tumor is established, if a leukemia is established in the mouse model, then that fraction will be labeled as LSC positive, LSC negative if it does not give rise to a tumor. In parallel, we run a tax seek on each of these fractions so we can compare the chromatin variants specific to LSC positive versus LSC negative. And when we do so, and we look at transposable elements, similar figure to what I showed you for normal hematopoiesis, we again find distinct enrichment where stem population, leukemia stem cells are all behaving similarly with one another and the non-stem populations or non-stem fractions are behaving fairly similarly with one another as well. And again, here with regards to which families are being enriched in accessible chromatin, HERV1, HERV3 come up for primitive population. So leukemia stem cell specifically accessible, SIGN1, SIGN2 enriched in the leukemia stem cell negative fraction. Wanting to see if there was something distinguishing cancer from normal gave us a chance to compare which transposable element families were accessible in leukemia stem cell positive versus primitive, for instance. And so this figure shows that we could indeed find similarities between leukemia stem cells and primitive populations. But we also identified unique transposable element families accessible only in leukemia stem cells. For those of you a bit familiar with the repeat genome analysis, to no surprise, we identified LTR12C previously shown to play a role in oncogenesis and hepatocellular carcinoma, for instance, and prostate cancer, as well as a recent work from uh, Osgan Denis <clears throat> published in NatureCom a few years back linking activation of LTR12C to genes known to be associated with bad prognosis in AML. So amongst all the targets, some very of interest.
from our perspective, we wanted to assess whether we could improve patient stratification by trying to infer patients whose leukemia was filled with stem population, with leukemia stem cells versus deprived or minimized in amounts of leukemia stem cells. So we came up uh, with a signature, which we call the LSCTE121 signature, that enables us to assess from bulk attack seek in the patient AML sample, the similarity that it has with a leukemia stem cell positive versus a leukemia stem cell negative fraction in terms of accessibility over repetitive sequences. And if we do so in stratified patients, those that look to be very similar to leukemia stem cell positive population have a worse overall survival, have a worse disease-free disease survival than patients that have a low signature of accessibility over transposable elements typical of leukemia stem cell. So with this, I'll conclude by just uh, summarizing what I've shown. Cancer is a disease of genomic variation that is defined not just from genetic variants, but as well from chromatin variants. These chromatin variants, as I showed you in normal hematopoietic stem cells, identify DNA sequences that are permissive, in this case for CTCF, for instance, uh, and therefore define genetic determinants of stemness property in normal hematopoiesis. By extension, when you start now looking into uh, the repetitive genome, you can actually see that the repetitive genome can be used to infer which populations have stemness properties versus which ones don't in both a normal setting as well as in a cancer setting, whether it be normal hematopoiesis or leukemia, acute myeloid leukemia. Okay, so with this, I'll thank the people that were involved in the work. So huge collaboration with the lab of John Dick, uh, Gene Wang, Mark Minden, uh, and fabulous work led by my group, specifically by Giacomo Grillo, as well as Bettina Nadorp. And I'm very excited to take any questions you have and as well to invite you to pay close attention to the work that Giacomo will present uh, next uh, that expands on what I've shown you, but specifically looking at a different cancer type in pancreatic and in, in, uh, prostate cancer, sorry. So thank you very much. Thanks, Mathieu. I think you gave us a lot to think about uh, in terms of the non-coding genome and how it affects you know, no normal development as well as, uh, as cancer. Really, really interesting talk. I'm going to start with some with some uh, um, questions from the audience. The first one is, um, is uh, refers to the, the first part of your talk, the mutations in the non-coding genome. Um, the question is about how many of them, how many of these, how many of these non-coding mutations specifically affect uh, super enhancer elements. Uh, with regards to super enhancer per se, we've not done that analysis with regards to large domains. Um, it can be done. We just have not moved in that direction. That might be a question best answered by individuals such as Rick Young that have been putting forward the concept of super enhancer. Uh, personally speaking, we have not uh, necessarily invested much in characterizing super enhancer within cancer models, but it's definitely something that's doable. The data is available. It's just a question of calling these clusters of regulatory elements. I don't call them super enhancers. They're clusters of regulatory elements. Um, and, and assessing their mutational load. So there's um, uh, chromatin accessibility data available from TCGA samples that has been released by uh, Howard Chang and William Greenleaf, to name a few. So the data is there. Um, yeah, so it's a good, good aspect to look into. Um, we haven't explored that space yet. Okay, I, I have a kind of a, kind of a follow-up question to that though. Do you think that we're gonna find passenger mutations in the non-coding genome, uh, even, in, even in areas that are important, like again, these clusters of regulatory elements or uh, some other important regions like our promoters. So, so, a, so a driver, so, okay, so here's the definition, right? What do we call a driver? We call a driver something that is burdened by mutation more than expected by chance. We do not call a driver something that actually functionally makes a difference to whatever unit we're measuring. So are all mutations found in genes functional? Uh, when they fall in a gene that is burdened by mutation more than expected by chance. I don't know. And I don't know that it's been tested. I know that a number of them are going to be functional. They're going to change the sequence and that's going to give you a truncated product or I don't know. In the non-coding space, what we've done is definitely try to infer the function of a number of mutations and test them using massively parallel reporter assays, for instance, and the likes. In our hand, what we see is that even within regions that are called as non-coding cancer drivers, whether they're regulatory plexuses or non-coding 
um, non-coding cancer driver cystrones. They're fine based on being burdened by mutations more than expected by chance. Of all the mutations we've tested, we don't find a functional disruption caused by each of the mutation. Some do change, for instance, the affinity for a transcription factor, but many of the mutations actually fall in the regions just outside of the transcription factor motif. And so are they functional or reflective of the biology of the tumor? Our interpretation now is that a lot of the, these mutations are reflective of the biology of the tumor. So mutations will accumulate where the system does not have time to repair, where the system, where the cost to repair is too high. And so we have this working model where mutations that fall within cystrones, for instance, within binding sites, can sometimes change the TF uh, binding affinity, but more often than ever, they are mutations that are tolerated because the machinery doesn't like the repair machinery does not necessarily have the opportunity to go and repair the DNA in these regions because the necessity for the transcription factor to remain and maintain its activity at those sites exceeds the need to repair. So that's the working model. That's, that's awesome. We have, we have a question from Guillaume Burke. I was asking, it's, it's, a, it's a question about the difference between the long term stem cells versus the short term stem cells. Right. And it points out that the main difference between these two populations is the loss of some accessible regions. So he's asking if you have looked to see if these lost regions of accessibility are associated with specific families of, of uh, TEs. Uh, so I wouldn't say loss necessarily. So if we look within the non-repetitive genome, we see gains. So the signatures are missing in the long term, gain in the short term. But that doesn't really matter. To Guillaume's point uh, or question, uh, there's definitely gains and losses uh, in terms of what we see. Uh, actually, no, over the repetitive genome, it, it's similar. That's the problem. So over the repetitive genome, they, they look the same. Over the repetitive genome, we cannot see distinct features, chromatin variants that stratify short-term versus long-term differently. So that's, a, that's where we're at. Yeah. The only space where we see the difference between long-term and short-term is within the non-repetitive genome. And it's where we see these regions that gain accessibility, and these regions have the CTCF motif. And accordingly, when you disrupt CTCF, you screw up the ability of long-term hematopoietic stem cells to remain long-term hematopoietic stem cells uh, and, and transition into the short-term hematopoietic stem cells. Okay, makes sense. We have lots of questions, but I'm just gonna ask you one more question between before we, yep. we switch to uh, Giacomo. So why, why are repetitive elements uh, uh, differentially accessible in the in the in the in the, in the metabolic cells are, are they being are, are they producing protein are they producing RNA what's what's the functional significance of, of that accessibility differences right so that's in part why I encourage you to listen to the talk from Giacomo he's going to be in a position to go in a little bit more of the details on the mechanisms of actions of these transposable elements looking at a different system but still applicable to the system that I just showed you the fact that we picked those up from attack seek data, therefore from chromatin accessibility data that typically calls regions of a few hundred base pairs inside in size and leads us to think that they are primarily acting as cis regulatory elements. But that needs to be demonstrated thoroughly. So Giacomo will show you how we're going about doing so. Awesome. Thank you so much, Mathieu. Fantastic. Thank you. As usual. Giacomo, it's now your turn. And so it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Giacomo Grillo. Uh, uh, to the to the CERC seminar series. Uh, Dr. Grillo completed his undergraduate studies in Milan. He was then selected to participate in a double degree program at the University of Milan and uh, uh, the University of Paris Diderot. Um, he, um, he, during his PhD, um, he was, his main research focus was uh, epigenetic determinants um, and molecular um, underpinnings of IS, ICF syndrome, which is a rare genetic disease affecting uh, only about 50 patients worldwide, but with uh, very severe uh, phenotypic consequences. Um, and that's where he developed his interest in uh, repetitive regions of the genome and the epigenetics of these regions. And uh, that led him to join Mathieu Lupien's lab in Toronto um, to, keep, to, keep the, uh, to keep the studies um, the study in, the, in the context of cancer. Um, so, Giacomo, please, the stage is yours. Thank you very much, Marco, and I'm very grateful and excited to be here and to have the chance to present this project today. So, 
Um, I'm Giacomo, and today I will be talking about how transposable elements are get reprogrammed at the chromatin level in prostate cancer, and how the study of reprogrammed transposable elements can unveil uh, prostate cancer vulnerability. So I don't have to go through much of the introduction because Matthew covered that for me, but I will just remind that nearly 50% of our genome consists of transposable elements. Um, transposable elements are scattered throughout all the chromosomes, and they, are grouped, they can be grouped together as multiple elements or genomic locations into what is defined as a family. So a family, just to give this couple of names, long terminal repeat seven or LTR7, are a group of elements that shared a common ancestor sequence. Families can be further um, classified into superfamilies like human endogenous retroviruses uh, type one so, or ERV1 or line ones. And as Matthew pointed out, uh, transposable elements play uh, an incredible number of functions in both physiology and cancer being transcribed and, and acting as cis-regulatory elements. But what is really fascinating about these elements, at least for me, is the chromatin dynamic that happens on these elements. Um, so transposable elements or TEs are heavily enriched in accessible chromatin in human embryonic stem cells, where there are very powerful cis-regulatory elements promoting um, the binding sites, acting as binding sites of pluripotency factors, promoting expression of uh, pluripotency genes, and uh, as binding sites of CTCF as well. During normal differentiation, there is a general lockdown of these regions at the chromatin level, mainly due by, mainly catalyzed by H3 K9 trimethylation and DNA methylation, but selected pools of T families are maintained active and act as tissue specific cis-regulatory elements, as depicted in this paper, where STAT1 binds specifically an MER41 transposable element, promoting the inflammatory response in monocytes. In cancer, there is a global reactivation of transposable elements, mainly due to the loss of K9, ME3, and DNA methylation. So after this brief introduction, what is really leading this project is that this hypothesis, so that there are epigenetic alterations triggering the reprogramming of TEs, acting as cis-regulatory elements, providing binding sites to key transcription factors as really a mechanism, and unveiling prostate cancer vulnerabilities. And by reprogramming, I really mean that TEs are brought back to a state, a chromatin state, that is not proper to pro normal prostate, but is more proper to stem cells. So all these stories, all these stories based on H3K27AC regions, so active um, enhancers and promoters or cis-regulatory elements, and Unlike um, hematopoiesis, we don't have a well-defined cascade of differentiation, unfortunately. Uh, so to study the programming of TEs and cis-regulatory elements in prostate, we can only compare the beginning and the end, so stem cells and normal prostate. And if we do so, and we score the enrichment of transposable elements, we can clearly separate benign prostate and stem cells. So here, every row is a TE family, every column is a sample, and as you can see, we identify 100 or so T families specifically enriched in normal prostate and hundreds of T families enriched in embryonic stem cells. Uh, these Ts enriched in normal prostate, they're not only enriched, but they're functional because they provide binding sites to key developmental transcription factors for the development of normal prostate, such as androgen receptor or AR and FOXA1. So at this point from this heat map, we have a, a set of Ts that can act as a signature to say what is proper to prostate or what is proper to stem cells. So if we apply this signature to two different cohorts of prostate cancer uh, patients, the CPC gene and the Porto cohort, we can see that there is one group of patients named group one, where you can see a lot of red, a lot of enrichment. So meaning that there is reprogramming of TEs in those patients. So the two cohorts behave very similarly and they reprogram 170 TE families to a stem-like chromatin state. Unfortunately, I couldn't find any kind of clinical feature that is different between these two groups, but I decided to dig into the mechanisms in which this reprogrammed TEs, the 170 uh, reprogrammed TEs are involved. And I could identify systems of 12 transcription factors that are frequently enriched only in group one patients. So the one that reprogram TEs. And among them, I identify AR, so androgen receptor, that is not only important for normal prostate, but is a driver of prostate cancer. Uh, 
I then used matched AR ChIP-seq performed in the portocortical patients to validate a higher enrichment of AR Systrom in group one patients over these TEs compared to the other groups. So after this results, there is, this result suggests that this signature, the stem process signature can discriminate patients based on their AR dependency. So patients that are more dependent on AR or less dependent on AR. And this observation is further confirmed by the use of cell lines. So in prostate cancer, prostate cancer cell lines are very well defined for their dependency on AR. And if we use the stem process TEs, we can clear cut distinguish cell lines that are heavily dependent on AR, like 24V1s, link caps, and B caps, and um, some other cell lines that are AR independent, so more prone to group two. And this dependency on AR is further confirmed by the essentiality scores uh, by RNA interference. So coming to this point, we have a beautiful set of TEs in cis regulatory elements that can distinguish patients and cell lines based on their AR dependency. So there are two main points that come out, two main questions. First of all, are these reprogrammed TEs essential for CREs? Uh, so are they doing something functional for the proliferation of cells, for example? And second, can we use this distinction to unveil novel drug vulnerabilities for these two groups of patients? So going forward with the first point, um, in order to assess and to answer this question, um, we uh, decided to use CRISPR. So we have in-house clonal cell lines, 2012v1 and link caps, so group one AR dependent cell lines developed by Stanley Zhao, a former PhD student in the lab, uh, stably expressing DCAS9 CREB. Um, I designed using RepGuide a cocktail of guides targeting one family that is reprogrammed and act as binding sites for AR. And when I nucleofact these guides inside these clones, I see a drop in the proliferation of three independent clones for both cell lines, suggesting that these TEs are actually valuable and essential um, cis regulatory elements in prostate cancer lines. What is now ongoing is all the molecular characterization of these cells with the guides, so a taxic to prove that there is actual uh, chromatin uh, closure at these elements. Uh, profiling of the Cas9 to see the correct binding of the Cas9 and the elements, and AR chip seek to show that AR is gone once we put the guides in and we have chromatin repression. For the second point, I took advantage of the huge amount of data that we have uh, nowadays, and especially drug screens performed in group one uh, cell lines, being cap in 23V1, and um, group two lines, DU145 and PC3. And I identified two different family of drugs that affect uh, the proliferation of group one or group two lines. Uh, these are bromodomain inhibitors and in particular bromosporine that affects, that is predicted to affect the proliferation of group one lines and MEK inhibitors and in particular AS703026 that affect group two lines. So I moved forward with the validations using crystal, um, crystal violet uh, assay and uh, cell proliferation assays. And as you can see, group one AR dependent prostate cancer cell lines are heavily sensitive on bromosporine, as you can see from the crystal violet staining and from the cell proliferation assay, but they are fairly insensitive to the MEK inhibitor. On the other way around, we see group two AR independent cell lines that are not sensitive at all to bromosporine, but they show a high sensitivity to the MEK inhibitor that we um, identified. So with this, I will just give you a summary of what I've been showing you today. So TEs are programmed from stem cells to benign prostate, and they participate to the benign prostate identity, acting as binding sites for androgen receptor FOXA1. TEs are reprogramming in a subset of prostate cancer patients. Despite we didn't see any kind of clinical difference between the two groups, uh, we could see that TEs can distinguish cell lines and patients based on their AR dependency. Reprogrammed TEs are essential for prostate cancer cell survival uh, with the ongoing analysis of the TIGR3A as an example. And reprogrammed TEs led to the identification of due vulnerabilities for prostate cancer cell lines and potentially patients using bromodomain inhibitors and MEK inhibitors. With this, I wanna thank uh, Matthew to begin with, who's been, who is an incredible mentor and with endless support with the work that I've been doing. All the people of the Lupion Lab, that is just uh, an amazing environment to conduct a postdoc and to um, study all this kind of cool stuff about research. Uh, 
all the alumni that uh, were amazing during my postdoc, all the collaborations we had within our institute and abroad, and I would be happy to take any questions. Grazie mille. Thank you, Giacomo. It was a fantastic talk. Thank um, you. So I'm going to start with a few questions from the audience. Um, so if you look at prostate cancer patients, they have this enrichment for TEs, okay? They have this, the TE signature. Do you also see any uh, enrichment for gene sets associated with inflammation or interference signaling? I'm, mm. I'm assuming this person is kind of hinting at uh, viral mimicry, potentially. Yeah. So... Um, I haven't done this analysis, to be honest with you. Um, what I actually observed is that um, not necessarily there is overlap of TEs that act as cis regulatory elements and TEs that are actually transcribed. So sometimes there are different families doing different things. Um, this is to say that I don't have a definite answer to that. Um, but my guess is that TE families would be different between the two. Okay. And then there is a question that was originally addressed to Mathieu, but I think it would be appropriate for uh, what he just showed. So there are quite a few papers now that show that um, transposable elements and the RNA produced from the transposable elements can affect the 3D genome architecture. Okay. So I was wondering if you think that in prostate cancer, this might be one of the mechanisms that uh, for, the, for the phenotypes you're seeing, for the molecular phenotypes you're seeing. Yeah, so that's a, that's a very cool point. So I think there are two main points that I wanna bring up. Um, one is the actual transcription of, of transposable elements. And there is a beautiful paper on herb H elements that are transcribed and they are mediating and their transcription is important for the three genome, 3D genome architecture. And the other one is TEs that are binding sites of CTCF. Both to me are incredibly valuable. Um, again, they're not necessarily the same. In prostate, um, for what I've never, I haven't seen CTCF coming out, but most likely because I'm working on H3K27 AC regions. If we were working on attack, we could see something on it. Um, we have a paper that was recently published um, tracing and assessing the 3D genome organization of prostate cancer patients comparing to benigns and, and so on and so forth. And we couldn't see so much of a difference in the 3D genome organization between benign uh, prostate samples and prostate cancer samples. So this is to say that 3D genome are, the 3D genome is not that different from what we observed, at least in prostate cancer. Uh, probably using TEs, we could spot some differences, but again, the 3D genome is something that is not that heavily altered for what we observe. All right. Okay, thank you. Um, there's one more question from the audience. That, um, they're asking specifically about uh, whether uh, TMPR SS2 erg fusion, uh, they might, if this fusion might be related to group one versus group two effects that you're seeing? I wish. No, this is a great point. So um, this was one of the first things that I tried to see um, because we were, I mean, we, we published that the tempers 2 erg fusion um, alters heavily the cis-regulatory pattern of patients um, at the signal level, at least. Um, so I was hoping to see a difference between the, the T2E and the non-T2E. For my observation, T2E patients are scattered in the two groups, kind of in the same number. So I don't see any difference in terms of T2E, non-T2E. Um, and I try also to force and see if I um, really show, trying to compare T2E and non-T2E patients, I could see some difference. I see some differences, but um, I ended up not following up uh, because there was something more related to the AR system. Um, my, my, my hypothesis on why we don't see much on the T2E, non-T2E, it's because it's really at the level of the signal of H3K27EC, more at the, the genomic low side. This at least is what um, I would think. Okay. I'm going to ask you one more question before uh, I let you go. Yeah. Uh, there's a question about the effects of the BAT inhibitors on uh, chromatin structure at the genomic locations that harbor these um, transposable elements? 
Have you looked at them? So I have never, I haven't done anything after the treatment. So after the use of the drug, I was more interested in trying to predict a sensitivity and see that um, the drug was working more than what it was doing after. Um, there is definitely a value in, since there's our new drugs and they seem to work, there is definitely a value to see the long-term um, effect of these drugs once they, for example, you may develop tolerance and resistance to these drugs. Um, unfortunately, I don't have any guess of what could happen at TEs because I haven't done it. Awesome. Thank you very much. Thank you. So I'd just like to thank the, the speakers, Matteo Lupian and Giacomo Grillo for um, um, donating their time to us today. Uh, they were really, very illuminating talks um, and I learned a lot from them. I hope the audience has too. Uh, I'd like to thank our, uh, so, um, our partners at ActiMotif uh, for co-sponsoring this, uh, this, um, this seminar series. And I would like to thank the over 230 attendees of today's uh, seminar series. Uh, it was, uh, you know, you're really contributing to the success of our series and, uh, um, you know, for your attendance and your questions and your active participation. So thank you. A reminder that the, uh, we'll have uh, the next seminar, uh, seminar for CERC, the CERC series will be on March 25th. And the speaker will be Dr. Pamela Hoodless, a BC cancer um, and the University of British Columbia. And it will be again at 9 a.m. Uh, Pacific time or 12 uh, p.m. Eastern time. So I'm looking forward to seeing all of you again uh, virtually uh, on March 25th. Okay. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Mathieu and Giacomo again. Thank you very much.